Friday. Welcome to, it is the first Friday of the month, which means it is Dietitian Talk. And we are joined with almost all of our dietitians, minus one, Vicki Schemmer, who's our diabetes metabolic specialist. But uh, our other dietitians here are going to introduce themselves. I am James Marin, uh, Integrative Registered Dietitian, Environmental Nutritionist. I'm Dahlia Marion, Integrative Registered Dietitian Nutritionist, and we're the co-founders of Married to Health, and we're excited that we're joined here today by two of our amazing dietitians. We always love these talks, so we'd love to hear from you both. Katie, we'd love for you to introduce yourself to those who don't yet know you. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Chakos. I am the newest registered dietitian with Married to Health, and I am a uh, registered dietitian nutritionist. And I'm Joseph Barloni, registered dietitian, and I specialize in disordered eating, eating disorders, and reclaiming a healthy relationship with food. Love it. And guys, today's topic that we chose, but we're also keeping an eye out for those of you watching live on Facebook or YouTube, or wherever you're watching, uh, we're going to be looking for your questions. We're talking about plant-based nutrition. If you have questions about all things plant-based nutrition, we want to see that. Obviously, if you have other questions like, hey, how do I make an appointment or whatever, we're, we're going to look at that as well. So we're going to be answering. It's a live Q&A. We'll be taking your questions. But we did want to discuss the idea of plant-based nutrition. It's ever-growing. And for those that don't know, Dolly and I have been 100% plant-based for the last about 12 years, which is crazy to think. And it makes you feel a little old at times. Me, not Dahlia, of course. But um, I reverse age. She reverse ages. <laughs> I just age. So, but it's interesting and, and just kind of seeing new generations come into plant based and what that means. I kind of want to just start out by defining it. You really, really plant based is just saying, hey, a majority of your diet, you're eating plants, right? And plants are uh, legumes, nuts and seeds. Of course, fruits and vegetables, right? Whole grain. And, and whole grains. Yeah. So we are eating a variety of these plant foods. Now, someone could say, hey, I'm plant-based and 60% of their diet, they're eating plants. Someone can be 100% plant-based. Plant-based and those that are 100% can also, it kind of merges and, and kind of gets jumbled a little bit with vegan, uh, the term vegan. However, veganism is more of a lifestyle and an ethical movement as opposed to someone who's more 100% plant-based, they're usually there for their health or they're talking about like whole food plant-based and then you can dive into all the different factions and, and nuances there. But overall, plant-based nutrition is saying, hey, nutrition that is emphasizing and really focusing on plants being a majority of your diet and where a majority of your nutrition is coming from. What do you guys think? Did I miss anything with that brief overview or? No, I don't think so. And, you know, you touched on the health aspects of it, the ethical aspects of it. And that, like you mentioned, gets more into vegan where being vegan is a lifestyle. It's not necessarily a diet. It's not a way of eating. Being vegan is someone's lifestyle. They don't buy products like leather or any products that have been made with any animal products. They don't buy things that have been tested on animals. Ethically, they abstain from anything and everything that has to affect animals as to the best of their abilities. Um, and then, you know, we have people who are plant forward, plant based also for environmental reasons. So mm -hmm. that's another motivator. Um, but we'd love to hear Katie from you because we know plant forward is your specialty. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on all things plant-based and plant-forward nutrition. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks guys. So I have been plant-based and following a vegan lifestyle for the last 10 years or so. I can't believe it's been that long, um, wow. but it has been, um, I went plant-based in college. So I have gone through all of the trends in plant-based nutrition, and I'm sure some, if you've been plant-based for a long time, you know what some of those things are. I've made all of the mistakes. Um, I still make mistakes, and I still am learning through this process. Um, but when it comes to plant-based nutrition, I know one of the things that can often become a big part of the conversation is budget. And it's so expensive. And this is not just with plant-based, but just with more healthy eating in general is it's so expensive to eat healthy. And that is true in some aspects and in other aspects, it's about food access and things like that. Um, but also a lot of times people are saying that 
plant-based nutrition is so expensive because people are pushing superfoods and that you have to buy all of these specialty vegan options at the store, the delicious vegan cheeses and the mock meats. And yes, all that can get quite expensive, but there are plenty of ways to meet all of your nutrient needs while kind of sticking to whatever budget that you have. Love it. Very, very true. I mean, when you're talking about all the different types of legumes, right, we're talking about all the different types of beans, peas, and lentils. Um, and when you're talking about dried bean, beans, peas, and lentils, I mean, those are some of the cheapest forms of protein. And you're talking about quality uh, amino acids, right? We're talking about essential amino acids. And we call them that because we get them from our diet. Just like someone eating meat, you're getting essential amino acids from that meat. You can also get those from things like soybeans, from lentils, from uh, you know other types of pinto beans and chickpeas. And you're getting all these wonderful amino acids from these really, really inexpensive foods. Um, obviously if that bean is like fermented and made into this beautiful like dip and it's organic and it's at a whole foods, it's probably gonna be a lot more expensive, right? A lot of more time and input has gone into that. But like, like Katie's saying, right, it can get really expensive and high end, but really there is that just really basic level that is super accessible and super affordable. And we love that. I mean, there's, there's such a spectrum there. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, when patients bring this up, I, I bring up the same point. You don't have to buy all of these very specialty products. A lot of them you can make if you wanted to, right? You can easily make some of these cashew cheeses at home. You could make chickpea frittata or pumpfu, which is pumpkin seed tofu. I always kind of say weigh the risks and benefits, right? It's your time or someone else's. So, you know, if you're somebody who has a limited amount of time, your time is very valuable. Um, you're a busy person. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of those things are worth the investment if that helps you up your nutrition a little bit. If you're not, and you're somebody who has ample time and you really enjoy being in the kitchen, not only is it very budget friendly to buy these staples, these whole grains, these whole legumes, you can even go as far as buying dried legumes and soaking them yourself and cooking them yourself and canning them yourself if you wanted to. Um, and then of course, you know, produce, right? There are ways to make produce more affordable, such as buying frozen or buying things that are seasonal and buying things that are local. So they might be a little bit more affordable. So if you're somebody who has the time to do that, great, then that's in your best interest. That's budget friendly and time friendly because time is valuable. Um, and so I think there are so many ways to work around that and so many ways that yes, it can be expensive. I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I find myself buying a $12 vegan cheese, but you know, that's definitely few and far in between, but the rest of the budget is really devoted to some of those just unprocessed whole foods. So it doesn't have to break the bank, but it could, if you can afford it, if you want to, but if you can't afford it and you don't want it to, does not have to. And timely question coming in. And again, for anyone watching, if you have a question, submit it right there down below in the comments and we'll pop it up. What are your favorite plant-based protein sources? Who, who wants to, anyone have favorites that they want to answer first? I more so have like a, oh, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I have more of like a favorite category. I think the legumes are where it's at for me. I am still working even 10 years into my vegan journey, loving tofu and tempeh and really experimenting and finding the ways that I love to prepare it. So if anybody has their favorite ways, let me know. I'd love to try them. But I am always roasting chickpeas or throwing beans into as many things as I can. Um, even lentils are great, especially if you buy them dried. They're very easy to cook from dried um, and are just delicious and kind of take on whatever spices you throw at them. Love it. What were you going to add, Joseph? <laughs> uh, I was going to say I recently tried uh, tempa, tempeh for, for yeah. the first time a few weeks ago. So I've been experimenting with weight. At first, I was just eating it like a like a candy bar. <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> like, okay, this, this is, I kind of like it. Uh, you should, should have got video of that. I've never yeah. seen that. That would have been so um, cool then, to see. Yeah. Now I'm now I'm experimenting with like different ways to cook with it. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
Mm. Love it. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with tempeh, tempeh is fermented soybean cakes. So they're, I guess, a candy bar to Joseph. <laughs> they're these little bars. You can see that they're fermented usually with rice. So you see pieces of soybean in there. You see the rice in there. Um, and it's more earthy than tofu. Tofu really is kind of just a unanimous blob, I would say. Like there's just no specific flavor tofu has on its own, but it will take on the flavor of anything that you add to it, which right. I love. And I think so many of us appreciate about tofu. Tempeh, it brings its own earthy notes, I would say. And so I learned a tip because it can be a little bit bitter. So with tempeh, you can definitely um, steam it before you cook it because steaming it will remove some of those bitter undertones that it has and it will help absorb more of the flavor that you add to it as well. And we, when we make tempeh, we like to do things like crumble it into a pasta sauce. So it almost has that meaty texture. You can crumble it into tacos. I like mm. to make tempeh bacon out of it. I bought some liquid smoke and adding some other flavors. It makes a really yummy TLT, like a tempeh lettuce and tomato sandwich. Love doing that. Mm. Um, or even just cubing it and roasting it. So same. I, I'm I'm a big tempeh fan. Our daughter is not. So I, I will say that whenever we make tempeh, Layla's like, dang it, I really wanted tofu yeah. or beans. She's I'm not the biggest honest. tempeh eater. But um, we've also recently tried a couple of other things like pumfu, pumpkin seed tofu, which is cool, high protein, higher fat than tofu, but um, it has really great omega-3s in it. So pumfu is another cool one that's high protein. Mm -hmm. um, and then a couple of my favorite beans that are higher protein are things like lupini beans or mm -hmm. um, yeah, soybeans, I think edamame and soybean. And then just a comment, you know, some of the latest research, just to clarify, I mean, I know a lot of people still think like, oh, plants, you have to, you have to, um, compartmentalize the plants and then and then oh some of these plants you got to put with the others and really what we know now with amino acids is our body has storage systems and, and like a pool and a banking system of amino acids so i think yes on one end that kind of notion of complementary proteins is true in a sense that you want to eat a diversity of foods and a di and especially if you are going more plant-based you want to eat a diversity of plant foods especially high protein plant foods but it's like, you know, if there's one day you didn't mix the, I think the old kind of uh, analogy was like, oh, mixing peanut butter with whole grain bread gives you a complete protein. But even if there's a day where you didn't maybe necessarily get all or maybe some of the amino acids, uh, specifically essential amino acids, your body has a pool of those amino acids. So as long as the rest of the time you are getting that diversity, you are getting that variety, then you're you're good, and that that's what makes things like soy and hemp really special. Is that they will have uh, the essential amino acids. They are this really cool, um, perfect plant protein in some ways, and that's why they're so special. For so long, soy has been called the miracle bean, and that's where my favorite. My favorite is tofu. I have to say, like tofu is just, especially the higher protein where it's really hard, like extra firm. I mean, you just you can add any flavor you want, air fry it, and it's just so delicious. You could put it in anything. Or be I, like I love James. It. James often is found eating a raw tofu Guys, and mustard sandwich. I'll be honest. It's, I'm going to do some truth lettuce. telling. Um, when you're just lazy and, and busy, and if you just slice some raw tofu really thin, it just it's like a sandwich meat, right? It's like a lunch meat. It's just you can put it in any sandwich, build the sandwich however you want, and it's just a nice thin little slice of protein in it. And it's it's really good. Mm -hmm. You hate on it, but it's really I'm good. I'm not hating. I'm glad it works for you. Um, <laughs> someone's saying raw tofu and peanut butter is pretty good. Interesting. And I love this comment that we got. Someone said, I love tempeh. I eat it like a candy bar too. So Joseph, you're not well alone. Done, man. Someone else out there is doing it too. And someone's saying, also, Katie, have you tried making crackers out of thin tofu slices in the air fryer? Mm. I'll have to I'll have to try it and we'll, I'll report back. <laughs> Sounds delicious though. I do I will say I I end up blending my tofu a lot. Mm -hmm. And I make ravioli for special occasions with my Ooh. family and so I'll add tofu blended into like my ravioli filling um or in like my sauces and things like that and it just adds like a really delicious creamy nutty flavor. It's I that's the way I like it. Yes. And I, you know, we've spent five minutes talking about tofu because it really deserves these minutes. Like tofu is, if you tolerate tofu, 
it can be an amazing texture, protein, just addition to really so yeah. many dishes. Um, I like to make, I love what you're saying, Katie, um, blending it into things. And, you know, James mentioned high protein. If you're blending it into things, you might want to go for a silken tofu or a softer tofu. I think people don't really realize the various textures of tofu also that are available out there where if you're blending it into something like sometimes I'll suggest to my patients to blend it into smoothies. If they're looking for extra protein and calories in smoothies, blend some silken, very soft tofu into there. There's medium, there's firm, there's extra firm, there's super extra firm, which is also called high protein. You can freeze it, which gives it kind of a, a bubblier texture, like an airier texture, and then thaw that. We have a tofu press that we use, or you don't need one. You can just press it with books or something else. Um, but tofu is really cool because you can do so many things like blend it into things, eat mm -hmm. it raw. I like making toast foo. So I will thinly slice it, air fry it so it's nice and crispy and use it instead of toast sometimes. So it's like a cool high protein toast option. Or I saw this amazing video the other day. This dude was making tofu fries where he roasted or you can air fry them and crisped them up and they were tofu fries. So interesting. Shout out to Tofu. I don't know how I feel about that, <laughs> but yeah, okay. I kind of want to. I kind of want to get to this. We had a. Mm. This is real life, so guys. Have, I love it. Yes, we there's have this someone great saying question. there's no art to tofu. We have another person saying I absolutely love tofu. So, shout out to Tofu. We we all have an appreciation for tofu, tempeh, edamame, soybeans, and I will say though, not everyone can tolerate tofu. So for a lot of my patients, I specialize in gut health with a special emphasis on irritable bowel syndrome and SIBO, small intestinal bacterial or methanogenic or fungal overgrowth. And sometimes with my patients, we do discuss a low histamine diet. And um, histamines are these, they're biogenic amines. So they're an active component in our immune system that sometimes people are reacting to. Soy is high histamine. So sometimes my patients are not able to eat or tolerate soy, and I completely recognize that. So in those cases, I'll suggest things like if you really miss that texture, let's try pumfu. Pumpkin seeds are low histamine. Why don't we try hemp foo? Hemp seeds are low histamine. You can try making your own chickpea frittata since chickpeas are low histamine. So there are always workarounds if there are times when you need to avoid certain things that you really enjoy and you want to go for kind of that same texture and similar nutritional benefit. And here's a very interesting question, guys, and anyone can jump in, but I plan on trying the keto diet. I only plan to eat seafood and chicken for animal protein. No dairy, no pork or beef. Do you do y'all follow someone on socials who follow this lifestyle for guidance? Well, I mean, or, or does anyone wants to jump in, but I think this this kind of segues nicely into what Dahlia's kind of mentioning and what I would ask this person. So Alvi, shout out. I love it. And we're, we're all open for discussion here, even though a lot of us are plant-based. Um, but, you know, we're open for this discussion. And really, I would ask why, you know, it's, it's really assessing the why. Like, why are you planning to try the keto diet? Why do you feel the need to only, you're only going to plan to eat seafood mm -hmm. and chicken for animal protein. Now, I don't know if that's all you're going to eat in general, or if you're going to add some other greens or, you know, legumes or other things, but, or if you're just eating the animal protein, it sounds like that. I feel like you're not doing dairy because on keto, it's pretty much like you're eating bacon, you're eating lots of cheese and fats and animal protein. So, um, but they're doing seafood and chicken and seafood and chicken. For the yeah. most part, I think people, We'll do keto for a few reasons. The most studied reason is for seizure disorders and epilepsy. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of people will follow keto for weight loss. And then some of my patients will say, I went keto because I wanted to cure my gut symptoms. And one thing that I like to say is <laughs> taking away symptoms is not taking away the cause of the symptoms. So when we're avoiding fiber, a lot of the times you might not have the gas and the bloating that come with it, but that doesn't mean you don't have the dysbiosis, the imbalance of who's living in your gut or the dysmotility, the struggle for proper movement in your gut. Um, so if you're doing it to avoid those symptoms, it doesn't necessarily take you to the root of the issue. So I think um, that 
it's an interesting question. Um, and really, I always ask people, what's your motivation for doing this? But we'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Joseph, do you have any thoughts on keto and um, any any credible sources for guidance? Um, yeah, I have my thoughts on keto. Uh, I'd like to also touch on Eduardo's after this, if you guys yeah. Yeah, uh, I found it interesting. Um, but yeah, keto, I think it's, um, like you said, it was made for people that have epileptic seizures. Um, and it's kind of morphed from there. <laughs> because the one that's used for epileptic, epileptic seizures is very high fat to the point where you have to add lots of oil just to get the ratio to stop the seizures. Um, so I, with this question, if you're only eating the seafood and chicken as your main source of calories, um, I would be concerned about something called gluconeogenesis to where when you're getting that excess protein and you're not getting um, calories from other sources, the protein actually has to be processed twice. Um, it goes once through the digestive system and then it has to go back through the liver because your liver wants to get glucose. Um, so that's, that could be an addition to some of the fatigue that people see on the, the ketogenic diet. Um, but yeah, so that would be, that would be one of my questions is like, you know, the, are you still planning on getting variety? Cause Personally, that's one thing I always like to promote in like whatever you're doing, even if you're trying out like a specific diet, um, are you still going to try to expand and get as much variety as you can in that diet? Um, so yeah, I don't, lots, lots of thoughts on it. Um, I don't know. I did try it once in college. It was, uh, it was interesting. I wasn't able, like I was able to do it for six months. I think that's, pretty standard. Like, I think that's where people hit a wall. Um, mm -hmm. But I did follow. Um, I forget the doctor's name. He was pretty good. Uh, there's Dr. Del Del Bredesen, mm -hmm. who studies Alzheimer's. Um, he's got some interesting stuff on it. Um, but yeah, I would just I'll just go back to James's like question of like, what what's the reason for doing it and then from there you kind of like uh did, like tailor it to your needs totally yeah that's a great point and you know there is a possibility i do have some patients who whether it is for weight loss or seizures um they have tried plant-based keto so that's always an opportunity as well and they'll have things like lots of tofu. Um, they'll do lots of lupini beans and other plant-based keto sources as well. So if that's one's goal, I think discuss it with your care team, make sure it's appropriate for you. Um, I would say probably keto is not appropriate for somebody who already has a lipid disorder and they already have very high cholesterol. Um, so that would be a time where maybe um, animal-based keto is maybe not in your best interest or even a plant-based keto if you're using a lot of coconut oil and coconut products because you're looking for that saturated fat. Um, so you definitely want to discuss it with your care team. Make sure it's appropriate for you. Katie, did you have any final thoughts on keto? Yeah, I think just reiterating what everybody else said, really asking why somebody is looking to do keto. I think oftentimes now too, Keto has kind of become synonymous for just a low carb diet and mm -hmm. they may not actually be measuring ketones or kind of truly going into ketosis. And if it's more for weight loss, there are lots of ways to play with your macronutrients for weight loss. So as long as you're getting in a calorie deficit, kind of regardless of how you go about that, you will see that weight loss happen. Um, so from there, I really focus more on the nutrient intake in regards to kind of going through that process. Um, so yeah, just reiterating, really figuring out what what's the end goal and why was this something that somebody would be interested in doing? Love that. Yeah, the macros, micros, and the movement, all things that are important. Love so it. great question. Love these questions. I'm yeah, glad we can discuss questions. them. And 
like Joseph mentioned, we have another really great question on um, being mainly plant-based. So Eduardo is asking, being mainly plant-based, does it hinder social gatherings or is your inner circle of friends and family also plant-based? So I'll Mm. turn it over to Katie first because Katie, you said you've been 100% plant-based for 10 years. So we'd love to hear from you first. This is a great question. I am actually the only plant-based eater in my family. And it wasn't really until I went to graduate school that I found a community in my real world, not just online, but in my true real world of plant-based eater. So I've kind of been flying solo in my world for a long time. Um, And it definitely was a discussion with my family at first. And because I went plant-based at a younger age, the concern was mainly about, hey, are you doing this safely? I don't know a lot about this. You know, I just want to make sure you're getting what you need. Um, And after kind of educating my family, yes, I know kind of what I'm doing. I'm using XYZ resources. Um, It kind of just became um, easily accepted. Now, that's not going to be the case for many people. And I just want to emphasize that. Um, but for me, it's kind of around setting boundaries, especially like within my household, being the only plant-based eater. Um, and it kind of also depends on why going back to the why, which I think might kind of be like the theme for this talk is (laughs) right for me. It, I went plant-based for ethical reasons. So a lot of my boundaries that I set with friends and family are around that. Um, you may be a little bit more flexible and really be focusing on just health. So maybe you have a little bit of wiggle room on those special occasions where you have um, more animal-based foods or things like that and sticking plant-based in the overall context of your diet. So it's definitely conversations that need to be had and kind of setting boundaries where you're comfortable. Um, And hopefully your family understands. If not, I think um, maybe Joseph can kind of tie into how that may play with disordered eating behaviors or just kind of navigating more of like that social context around food too. Love it. Thank you. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you, Joseph. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Yeah, I love this this question, the why. Um, And kind of like what I wanted to touch on was the the individual aspect like we've been talking about. Um, I know for patients that have eating disorders or disordered eating, um, there have been patients that have followed a uh, vegan diet and they've done great. <laughs> there have been patients that are not able to follow that because they use it as a form of restriction. So in that in that context, it's again, all about like, why are you doing it? And what are you looking to get from it? So, so yeah, so a big part, a big part of um, me seeing patients that want to heal their relationship with food or um, have disordered eating, eating disorders. um, It's really a lot of it is just digging deep into that why and like asking, asking those questions like, there's some patients like, hey, I've been, you know, I just don't believe it's ethical to have, um, you know, to have animal protein. And those are the ones who are able to follow that and do well and, you know, work towards their goals with their eating disorder. Um, then sometimes there are others who, um, you know, might just be like, oh, like, here's everything that I eat now. And in addition to that, I want to go vegan when I start treatment. And it's like, Mm -hmm. oh, wait, like you're eating, you're only eating like a few foods already and you want to go vegan, Um, right? For them, it might not be helpful. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah, that that why is is very important for that um, because again, we want to, we want to be on the same page and, you know, there's a reason you want to like whatever diet you're trying, you want to do it. Um, but I think when you're coming to see a dietitian or um, a professional that's there to help guide you, um, really digging into that why and like um, giving you a professional opinion on, um, you know, maybe if we want to work towards that, we can. Um, I don't. It might not be helpful now, 
or like, hey, like, it sounds like you're doing great with this. Like, yeah, let's continue that. And let's, um, let's see how we could keep adding variety to that. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Love that. Yeah, I love it. And I just want to comment on the why just really, really quickly. I mean, it is, it's your North Star. And I want to just say like going plant-based, like when we went plant-based and this kind of segues into another question I see, but going plant-based is not easier. <laughs> like, like I'm going to be honest, right? Like it's not, I mean, it really, you really have to be conscious, right? And, and that why is that North Star guiding you on this journey of consciousness, whether it's for ethical reasons, health reasons, environmental reasons, you are opening up to a new level of consciousness, which takes energy and time and focus. And if you don't have that North Star guiding you, which is that why, and it could be for all those reasons or one of those reasons or whatever the case is, then you're more likely to be like, forget this. Like, I'm, I'm just going to go back and eat a steak and just drink a big thing of milk or, or whatever it is. Um, but I think what's really cool is when you're on that, when you're on that journey of consciousness, you find out just new levels of understanding of your own body, of your own community, of animal and animal welfare. Like I didn't start out for ethical reasons, but that was a whole nother layer of like, whoa, when I did kind of tap into that level of consciousness, I was like, wow, how many billions of animals are we slaughtering a year? And how are they treated? And wow, they're just as smart, if not smarter than dogs. And just that, that whole kind of juxtaposition of like, we love these animals, but these animals we torture and, and, and it's really hurtful. And it's like, wow, it's very, very interesting. So yes, the why and that North Star, amazing. And I think there's the why, which I love that. So with Joseph, Joseph focuses on the why. Katie is focusing on the why and the how. Um, you know, we are also focusing on that why and that how with people and to different degrees. So it's interesting because all of us are really in different positions where, you know, Joseph's plant forward, but not plant based. You know, Katie's the only plant based eater in our home. We, James and I, are in a home of all plant based eaters, right? In our home, there's three of us, and the three of us are plant based. Um, and so it, it's really interesting to kind of navigate these different situations. But we know that in our home of three, the three of us are plant-based eaters, but the rest of our families are not. Mm -hmm. And even some of our family members transitioned out of eating plant-based or being vegan and went back to just predominantly plant-based. And again, I think it's up to each person to determine what works best for you as an individual. What is the reason that you're doing this? Is this continuing to serve you where you are in your life and your goals with your health or with ethics or the environment or what have you? So um, I know for us, we don't usually feel hindered because our circle is conscious of us being plenty. So if we're going out to a dinner with my family, we are going to pick a place where we can all enjoy options. So my family, thankfully, is very conscious of that. And, and we agree. When we go on vacation, honestly, we will plan our vacations around like going around to food. eat at really <laughs> cool places because that's what we enjoy doing on vacation. We enjoy trying cool new foods. We went to Mexico last week and we got to try this amazing farm to table restaurant in Cabo called Acre. And that was an experience for us. So for us in particular, during travel, things like that, it's not isolating. Um, for our daughter, we have a seven-year-old daughter, Layla. We make sure when she's going to a birthday party or she's going to an event, again, it's more intentional. We're more conscious of it. We'll send her with a dessert that's plant-based or we'll talk to her about, hey, we're not going to have the dessert there how about we go get pressed or we go get an acai bowl or we go get a vegan ice cream after? And she comes into it again, understanding that. So um, yes, it takes a little bit more time, energy, and attention from us, but we are all in agreement that that's what we want in our household. Katie's in agreement for herself that that's what she wants. Joseph communicates with his patients that you want to make sure the why behind it. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I see two Two more good ones, but I don't know. What do you? Mm -hmm. Let's let's tackle them. Um, this kind of is a part two to that. Yeah. How long did it take you to follow the vegan diet completely, immediate or gradual transition? Just curious. Um, 
I'll start since I'm talking already. <laughs> but um, for us personally, it took, and James and I were kind of on this transition together. Mm-hmm. We just happened to learn about nutrition, health, plant-based nutrition around the same time when we were in college. And so for us, it was transitional and it was gradual over, I would say, about a year and a half, almost two years. Um, I never really grew up eating pork. We just did not eat it in my family, not for any particular reason, but just I wasn't lots of pork. available. <laughs> so it, that was easy. I was like, well, I've only had pork a few times in my life and I didn't really enjoy it when I did. Stop that. Um, and then from there, transitioned off of things like red meat upgraded them for other plant-based proteins, um, upgraded, you know, chicken, making sure that we were replacing so it was sustainable for us. Mm-hmm. Um, I know the last thing I stopped eating was eggs because I really enjoyed eggs. Um, and so it wasn't until I really perfected my tofu scramble and my uh, tofu bruschetta that I was making instead of eggs. That's when I finally gave up eggs. But you're, you were... Yeah, same. The la- last thing for me was cheese. I mean, I'm Hispanic, so like cheese and... I ate tons of like chorizo and bacon and sausage growing up and like, but overall cheese was the very last thing. But yeah, it was over a year and a half, two years of just transitioning and slowly phasing things out and experimenting. And then it was like officially like, okay, we're hundred percent plant-based, but it was, yeah. So overall the journey in total has been almost 14 years 12 of those years being 100% plant-based, but very similar to Dahlia. Um, and it's funny because now James will not eat plant-based cheeses. <laughs> like even if I we make a stand. vegan pizza, he's like, make mine without cashew cheese. Or even if it's like I'm a whole a cashew, anymore. he just, yeah. I've completely detoxed from cheese and I'm never going back. <laughs> it is really funny. Even if it's like completely whole food plant-based, James is like, no, nope, not my thing once anymore. Once in a while. I mean, um, once in a while. there's Once in a while, there's a good like cashew cheese, like um, – I can't think of the brand, but like there's a good clean one and like it's it's okay. But More even then food. I'll maybe have just a couple of bites and I'm I'm good. It's just too rich. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Katie, what about you? Was it a an immediate or was it kind of a transition? Yeah, I think in my mind I made the the change immediately, but it really took about a year. Um, I would say it was a slow, gradual change of I cut out dairy first or really like liquid dairy. So milk, cow's milk, things like that. Cheese was definitely the last thing that it was the hardest thing for me to cut out was the cheese. Um, But I also do want to just mention that when you do make a transition to a more plant-based diet is typically a much higher in fiber based diet as well. And so if you kind of go like overnight, fully whole food plant-based, you may, and Dahlia can speak to this a bit more as well, is you are most likely going to experience some discomfort. If you go from eating what the average American eats, which is about like 15 grams of fiber to plant-based diets can be upwards of 60 plus grams of fiber, your body needs some time to adjust. So give yourself grace in that, even though mentally you wanna be fully plant-based tomorrow, it will take some practice and some transition, and that is totally okay. Love it. Yes, yeah. your microbes need that time to adjust as well and learn how to transition. We have microbes that have an affinity to digest meat, and we have microbes that have an affinity to break down and ferment fiber. And so as your gut microbiome is transitioning, you slowly want to increase by about five grams of fiber per week. So maybe an additional serving of fruits or vegetables or whole grains or legumes every single week could help to ease that transition. And I just got to say, for jo- I know Joseph's health story Comment down below, guys, if you want to hear. I think Joseph needs to do like a just a little bit on his own health journey because Joseph has a great story. But even Joseph, I mean, just his transition to more plant forward and just everything going on. And like, dude, yeah, this, I'm just thinking of it now that this question's coming up. Like, Joseph needs to make his own little video on that. But yeah. like, do you want to comment on what, that, Joseph? Yeah. How that was for <laughs> you with tolerating more plants? Yeah, definitely. Um, This is, yeah, I'm probably at the most like variety of plants that I've been able to have for a long time um, because I've struggled with some, like Mm -hmm. a lot of gut health issues in in the past, like ever, probably the past 10 years. Um, But yeah, I've been, like you said, uh, the problem I had was like, I feel great today. I'm going to try all the fiber, like, you know, <laughs> instead, of, instead of just like 
hey, like, like I've been doing recently, like, oh, let me try a little bit of lentils. And then after that, like, you know, every few days I'm tolerating this well and then increasing the lentils. And then it's like, okay, I got to a certain point where I'm good with this amount of lentils. Now let me try something else, maybe like garbanzo beans or black beans, right? Um, and yeah, I got to say beans were a real game changer for me. Um, mm. I had avoided them for so long because they caused like bloating and really uncomfortable symptoms. Um, so I was one of those people that like, hey, I avoid beans and I'm healed. <laughs> <laughs> but once I was able to add them back in and then increase the amount I could have, um, yeah, it's just been my digestion has been way better. <laughs> that Love is it. great. So someone's in agreement. Someone's saying, yes, Joseph, make a video about becoming more plant forward or including more yeah. plants in your diet and tolerating more plants and fiber. So that would be awesome. That'd be cool. Got to do that. All right. How we? I think we're about out of time. This was wonderful. I see way more questions. Um, and we have wanna... a follow-up comment from our, our keto question. Yeah. So they were giving clarity as I know we said, talk about your why, figure out your why. So this person saying, I will include greens, fruits, and vegetables, more of a plant-based keto. Just wanted to let you know, those are the only animal proteins. And the mission is to cure my gut and to cure IIH, which is an idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So um, it sounds like Medical whiz over here. Yeah, it sounds like um, there's a reason behind them doing that. And so we wish you well and hope that Send you work you with your care energy. team. If you yes. need a care team for that, you can absolutely look into one of us as being part of your support for that. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, I think that we've had some really great questions today. Great interaction, great sharing on all of our parts. Is there anything that you all were hoping that we got to share Katie or Joseph, anything else, any other parting words that you have regarding plant-based nutrition and mm -hmm. plant forward nutrition and what you've seen in your own life, your patient's life, any, any exciting things that you've seen? I'm excited about what Joseph said, just to have him really share that story and, and mm -hmm. plan to do that. But let's have any parting thoughts, Joseph, anything to part with or leave us to ponder on regarding plant forward or plant-based when it comes to disordered eating, eating disorders or healing relationship with food? Yeah. Um, basically just the one thing I always go back to is balance. And then once, once we have balance, we can work in whatever direction that patient wants to work in. So if we, cause mo a lot of the times there is very black and white thinking around it where, um, I, I see myself as a very disciplined person, but man, some of the patients I've seen that are just like, I'm going completely vegan and like, maybe I'm only going to eat lettuce and like five different foods. And it's like, mm -hmm. so a lot of times the easiest way to get like a good base is let's return to balance mm. and you know a variety of foods and then from there we'll see what's working we'll see what's not working and then um we'll keep assessing like is plant-based right for you is another way of eating right for you you know um what's your why how did you do on just a basic balanced diet? And, you know, how are you feeling now? Where do you want to go now? Mm, I love that. And I, one thing I like to always share with my patients is discipline without love and intention is almost abuse, right? If you're just purely looking like a kid, if you're just disciplining without love and intention for it, it could be abusive. So you always want to ask yourself with those, love yourself, with those okay. intentions for the way that you're nourishing your body as well. Is there love in it and is there intention in it? Mm -hmm. So thank you, Joseph. Katie, do you have any last parting thoughts and some wisdom for us? Yeah, I think kind of going off of what Joseph was talking about with balance, just like with any more health promoting way of eating, making sure you're eating within balance, getting all of your nutrients, your macro and micronutrients. There are some specific ones of interest when talking about plant-based diets like our calcium, iodine, B12. There are some certain things we want to pay a little bit more attention to with a plant-based diet and kind of creating a, a well thought out plan and 
you have care team um, professionals that are here to help and also advocating for yourself within your healthcare journey and finding a care team that is willing to support and also kind of what we were talking about before, find out your why. Is it maybe leading you towards a disordered eating behavior that Joseph can help walk you through or that you're looking to actually make improvements in your cholesterol or, or other disease states? There's plenty of reasons around why and finding a care team that is here to support you um, is so, so important. Love it. And I swear, guys, we didn't plan this this comment or anything. Like, we feel the love. Thank, Thank you, you for, for those watching and commenting. And yeah, this is it. <laughs> we didn't plan all this. This is just great. It's flowing. It's vibing. I love it. Positive energy. Great uh, education. Very nice. Yes. James, do you have any last parting oh, thoughts me. on plant-based nutrition? No, I mean, I, I just see it. Honestly, um, Honestly, it's more for me over the years, but I, I see it quite simply. And I was explaining this on another meeting I think I was in the other day where I see it now, like my ethical, like I've, I've kind of evolved maybe ethical stance on it. Uh, of course, I have a health and environmental stance, but the ethical stance is really, I see it as I'm taking care of my microbes. Like I feel really good taking care of my microbes. And I see these little microbes as almost like little animals. And it's like, if we're able to take care of the smallest creatures and really, really nourish them and really take care of them, it's going to take care of all the bigger creatures, right? So it's like including humans, including our children, our future generations, including all the animals in our environment and therefore the ecosystem. So it is quite this ripple effect. And that's one way I look at it now is like I'm, I'm eating plants to just nourish my microbes, which in essence is the foundation of all life on this planet. So it's like if we can take care of the foundation of all life on this planet, we are taking care of all life on this planet. And it's quite profound and it's, and it's really cool and powerful. And that's kind of how I see it now. Mm -hmm. Love it. Yeah. And what about you, Delia? Yes. You Just from a gut health perspective, I think as a perspective of a dietitian in general, I echo the sentiments of adding as much diversity, adding as much variety as possible, especially if you are somebody who's dealing with gut issues. If you've been low FODMAP for years and you're a low FODMAP vegan, if you're low histamine vegan and this is going on months on end, um, really, really trying to hone in and trying to work on it so that way you can get back to a place of abundance and um, really thrive in that abundance on a plant, 100% plant-based, a plant predominant, a plant forward way of eating. So that way, again, you're loving yourself and you are giving yourself that loving, um, that love with that direction and that intention. And we hope that this conversation today helped you clarify the why behind why we do it as educated, registered dietitian, nutritionists, healthcare practitioners as to how we've done it, why we recommend it, why we support it, when we don't support it. Mm -hmm. And um, really just hope that this bolstered plant-based nutrition for you. Let us know if you're watching this later. Let us know if you want us to talk about any other topics. Like yeah. James said, we'd love to share our respective health journeys, Joseph's especially, um, but our respective health journeys, if that's something you want to hear about, but we'd also love to know what you want us to touch on. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, everyone, for another great Dietitian Talk. And uh, you can find Dietitian Talk the first Friday of every month. And you can go back if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, watch our past videos. We've had great topics and conversations. And there's a new video on the Mary Health YouTube channel every Friday. So whether that's a cool vlog or Good Gut Live or something else that's very cool, if you're watching from inside of our Good Gut group, hello to all of you. You guys get priority with questions and really great perks in our Good Gut membership group. So thank you everyone watching. Yes. And you can find Joseph and Katie on our website, Married to Health. You can find their content at the Dietitians of Married to Health Instagram page. You can find some of their content on our YouTube. And then where else can they find you, Katie, outside of those places? Because they need more places to find you. Um, where else can people follow you and find you? Yeah, so I am on Instagram and TikTok at katiechakos.nutrition. Love it. And what about you, Joseph? Where can people find you if they just um, can't get enough? 
I am on Instagram at Recovery Nutrition RD. Um, that's the letter R, the letter D. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nice. Perfect. Um, Perfect. And yeah, websites websites under construction. Um, so going through Married to Health website, you can find me there. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Well, thank you all. It's been a lovely afternoon with our dietitians, with you all, and we can't wait till the next dietitian talk. We hope you have a healing day and you heal with each meal. Bye, everybody.